All right. I think we will go ahead and get started. We, we absolutely have critical mass uh, from the numbers on uh, the interface, and so I'm delighted to welcome everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Mitchell Warren. I direct AVAC and have had the great pleasure over the last year or so to be working um, incredibly closely with um, FP2020, led by Beth Schlachter, who you'll hear from in just a minute, as partners in a collaboration alongside uh, what I think we all know to be a, a critically important uh, study that has been taking place over several years to explore uh, the potential uh, implications of three different contraceptive methods and HIV acquisition. Uh, clearly, just by that description that it's about contraceptive methods and HIV acquisition tell you why FP2020 and AVAC felt it so important to uh, align and collaborate with many, many other partners and delighted to welcome you all on this webinar. Um, I assume, I'm guessing most of you will have known already that the results were uh, released today in a presentation at the South African AIDS Conference, which was live streamed, I think one of the first times a, a flawlessly live streamed uh, um, uh, special session uh, that I've ever seen in real time. Uh, at the same time, the Lancet Journal uh, um, just posted the manuscript uh, um, online, and, and some of you will have undoubtedly seen that. Um, over the course of the next uh, hour or so, and uh, we suspect it may take a little more than an hour, um, we are delighted to be able to um, hear from the ECHO trial team, from civil society and, and, and ongoing engagement, and then perhaps most importantly, engage in a conversation together, um, which is not the easiest thing to do with over 500 people on a, on a line, but we are committed to this uh, process, all of us, in trying to engage in a conversation as best we can in this, uh, in this webinar and then surely many others to come. Uh, before we, we get started into the meat of it, a couple of logistical issues. Um, the lines are muted so uh, we can keep it clear and everyone can hear, um, and it will be recorded um, so people can refer to it if you miss it or miss pieces of it or want to pass it on to colleagues. Um, hopefully you're seeing already, if you're on the Zoom interface on a phone or a computer, you will be seeing a, a presentation that uh, the ECHO team will take us through. Um, uh, but in addition, at the bottom of the screen, you will see both chat uh, features and Q&A features. And we really want to encourage people to ask questions as we go. Um, and, uh, and we will put them in the queue and we'll get to as many as we can. And I think all of us are committed to making sure, even if we don't get to all of it on the call, um, we will uh, find ways to ensure these questions uh, uh, are answered uh, or addressed uh, by, by any number of, of parties. Um, so please do continue to put them in as we go. Um, if you are having any trouble and the chat feature doesn't work to tell us you're having trouble, um, or if you're dialing in um, and not able to see the, the slides um, and have questions, so either technical issues on the, on the call or questions for, for the ECHO team, um, you can please email info at familyplanning2020.org, uh, and those questions will get added into the queue. Um, and again, all of this is going to get updated later, and we'll be sharing the links all around. Um, so just want to say thank you in advance for everyone's engagement. Um, I um, uh, then will just be very brief in, in saying well, welcome to the ECHO team in South Africa who are all uh, in a room uh, very near where they just presented this special session. Um, and we're really um, excited to be able to give them a chance to describe the results to this audience. And I think perhaps the one thing I want to say is this audience, and some of you can probably see the participant list on Zoom, it really, um, we hope, reflects um, community, researchers, scientists, policymakers, funders across the broadest possible domain of what is really needed to be coming out of this result, a comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights agenda. Um, not about contraception only, not about HIV only, and, and that's what we're excited about um, because we, we have so many important things to, to talk about, about this trial and about the future. Um, I'm, I'm just going to pause there and, and turn it over to Beth Schlachter, who, as I said, uh, um, is the executive director of FP2020 and uh, has been a remarkable uh, ally, uh, mentor, and friend over the last year and, and um, to provide a little perspective. And then I'll um, introduce the ECHO team. Thank you very much, Mitchell. And I think this note of partnership between FE2020 and AVAC is a good starting point for where we all need to go together. F family planning and HIV have been seen as separate for far too long. 
And if nothing else from this incredible ECHO study, I think there's an important call here that we have to unite, we have to work together, and we have to ensure that our services are providing for the needs of the women and girls who, who are counting on us. I also want to start by thanking the many women, the over 7,800, who put their bodies, their families, their lives on the line to be a part of this trial. That's an incredible service to, to render to all of us so that we could have this moment where we're able to learn together and uh, to take things forward. So I, I believe all of us feel committed at this point in time that we will find a way to figure this out, that we will figure out who are the partners that we need to work with going forward. What are the gaps that we need to solve? And what are the steps that we can effectively take so that we're no longer separating, which for a woman is um, one unique experience. Women mostly get HIV and they only get pregnant through sex. And yet we treat this as if they're separate, um, separate events, separate processes and need to be treated in separate ways. We're also seeing through this trial that women in Africa are highly accepted of other methods besides DEPO. And while DEPO is the predominant method, it does not suffice to simply ensure that that's available. Method mix means that women have method choice. And what's clear from this trial is that women want to be able to choose. They want counseling that helps them put all this together into one choice. How do I avoid pregnancy? How do I avoid HIV? And which methods are safe? We know from this trial that the methods that were tested are largely safe and that they are well accepted. So how do we push forward to ensure that we're addressing the high rates of STIs and HIV that we're seeing? Because that's really the ethical demand that's coming from women. And I believe that everybody working in these two sectors are motivated to respond to, that, to, those, um, to those needs. So we know that there will be more to come in partnership. And you have our commitment from FB 2020, and I believe I speak for Mitchell as well, that we will continue to work together to dig through everything that we're gonna learn from this trial in the coming years. We're, we're looking at these, these top findings now, but I think it's really going to inspire, I hope, a change in the way that we do our business and the way that we learn together so that we can make policy and program decisions together to better serve um, the women who are counting on us again to get this right. So Mitchell, thank you for your partnership. Thank you and congratulations to the ECHO team. It's been an incredible effort over the past few years. Thank you for including us. And back over to you, Mitchell, for the rest of the webinar. Great. Thanks, Beth. And perhaps the theme of the call really is about partnerships, because as you'll hear in just a second, the ECHO Consortium um, is a unique partnership in, in designing and implementing um, a unique trial. Um, and I'm delighted to, to turn this over to a whole group that I'll introduce as a group, and I think you'll hear from a number of different voices. Um, if you were on the, the, the live stream, um, you will have heard Helen Reese, who leads the Vitz Reproductive Health and HIV Institute, um, is one of five members of the management committee of the ECHO trial and quite a unique structure, which you'll hear about. Um, but in addition to Helen, um, you, you will hear from uh, Jared Baton from the University of Washington, Nellie Mugo from the Kenyan Medical Research Institute, uh, Tim Mastro from FHI 360, um, and James Chiari from WHO, in some combination to take us through um, the trial, the rationale, the design, and the results. Um, as I say, there are slides that you um, will be able to see if you're on screen. And again, really want to encourage people, and already several of you have, um, to continue to put questions into the mix. And um, we will um, we will get them um, uh, as, as quickly as we can. Um, in addition. Um, to the trial team and the management committee, the trial has another unique facet, and that was the creation of a global community advisory group. And I'm, uh, on the live stream, you would have heard Yvette Raphael, a member of the GCAG, um, present, and we're delighted that Jackie Wambui is also there um, with, with the management committee of the trial to provide the GCAG and community perspective. A trial with 1,700 women in four countries does not happen with research alone. It happens because communities engage um, and support research, and Jackie will provide that perspective as well. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, um, a group sitting in Durban to um, describe um, where we are, where you all have been, and where we need to go. Thank you very much, Mitchell. Uh, this is Helen Reese here from the ECHO Consortium. Um, I'm just going to tell you who's going to be speaking, because we're going to take you through the slide deck. 
um, and we'll do it fairly seamlessly. The person will introduce themselves when they start speaking, but I, I'd just like to, to let you know who's going to be on. Um, I, I'm going to just make a few opening comments and um, and then I'll turn over to Nelly Muko, who will uh, give us a little bit more of the specific context of why we did ECHO. Um, Tim Mastro will, will make a very important acknowledgement to a dear colleague who started this journey with ECHO with us um, and sadly is no longer with us. And then Jared Beaton will take you through the results. James Chiari will outline WHO's future plans and response. And Margaret Casaro, who's one of our site PIs from Lusaka will comment. And then as you heard, Jackie Wambui, who's a member of our global community advisory group will also just make a few statements. We've cut down the slides from this afternoon's presentation. So it's, it's, it's an abbreviated version for those of you who might have watched. Um, but I think we would all like to say from the uh, ECHO uh, consortium side to, to, to Mitchell and to Beth, that there's the support of both of your individual selves, but also your organizations has been absolutely astonishing. And uh, you know has really transformed this into a, a really well-coordinated global message in terms of getting the results out. So thank you sincerely. Um, so let me just see if I can move on, hold on. No, there we go. So, um, so the, the, the first thing to say is that as Mitchell alluded to, this study is quite unique in the sense that it's been very successfully and very deliberately run as a consortium uh, that has involved African researchers, uh, US researchers, the World Health Organization, and it's been run through a management committee of five people representing FHI 360 in the University of Washington in the US, the World Health Organization, um, and WITS RHI from the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, and KEMRI, Kenya Medical Research Institute from Nairobi. So, uh, so th this is a, truly a, a joint effort um, and it's been run through a management committee rather than the traditional way of doing studies through principal investigators. Uh, in addition, on this slide, you'll see that we've had 12 participating organizations who've run the sites, and Margaret is with us from one of those. Um, and, uh, and they have uh, not only contributed to the implementation of the study, but also to the science and the thinking and the publication from the study. And very strongly, we've, we've from the outset, had a global community advisory group, which Jackie is representing here today. But each of the clinical trial sites has also had a community advisory group and, and uh, the, uh, the adherence to what we call good participatory practice uh, in the study has been um, and emphasized and is a priority. So moving on, moving on, we're having a bit of trouble here, there we are. So at the starting point is something I don't need to say to you all as a constituency, and that is that contraception is one of our very most important public health tools, contributing particularly to women's health rights, dignity and empowerment, but also to the health of children and to the well-being of communities worldwide. The context in which we did this study was that we have at the moment over 37 million people uh, living with HIV of whom more than half are women. And in the African region, nearly 600,000 new HIV infections occur amongst adolescent girls and women um, every year. Uh, we also have a very high uptake globally of modern contraceptive methods and of se over 700 million women, but uh, about 58 million African women using those methods. However, that figure, although it sounds a lot, uh, is hiding the fact that we have an enormous unmet need for contraceptive methods and uptake in the African region. And as I say, just to reinforce the fact that this is for, for, for many women and for women often in very vulnerable settings, this is an incredible tool to protect health and for social and economic upliftment. Now, um, there have been a lot of uh, talk and studies and many of you have been involved and have heard about the discussions on the, the possible relationship between hormonal contraception and HIV. It started with animal studies back in 1996, 
Then there were numerous studies, some deliberately designed as observational or cohort studies to see if they could see the same possible relationship between DMPA, IM, uh, uh, as was seen in the monkey model in, in women, in family planning settings. Um, but the problem with these studies is that they've all been observational in, in nature. And so it's been very difficult to say whether this is causality or whether there are other biases in those studies that are inherent to this type of study that might be misleading us to have this association. In this slide that you can see here, this map, was the kind of modeling that was being done before the ECHO trial started. And here the modelers have looked at the map for HIV incidence and prevalence. And what they've also looked at is where is the low and high uptake of injectable progestins, particularly DMPA IM, which was partic has been particularly the method that's been scrutinized for possible increased HIV acquisition risk. You can see that in this modeling, in the dark red, the areas where we have the sort of epicenter still for the HIV epidemic globally in southern and east uh, Africa is also the area where we've had we've got very high uptake and use of DMPA IM. But the problem is that maps like these don't establish causality. And in order to really uh, understand whether there is a true link or not, we needed to, do, to, to perform a randomized trial. And the rest of the, the presentation will really take you through the thinking that led up to the design and then the results of this study. I'm handing over now to Nelly Muga. Um, thank you, Helen. Um, Helen has given us a really good um, introduction into the history of HIV and hormonal contraceptives. We've had 30 years of epi and lab studies that have tried to determine whether there's truly an association between HIV acquisition and hormonal contraceptives. Some studies showed that progestin-only injectables, particularly intramuscular injectable depot, medroxyprogesterone acetate, were linked to HIV risk, but other studies did not. In a recent meta-analysis, the magnitude of that increased risk was approximated at 40 to 50 percent. Additionally, more recent studies in selecting high-quality studies had shown up to a magnitude of a two-fold increase in risk, creating real concern about this association. Very few studies have looked at HIV risk with other highly effective contraceptives such as the intrauterine device, hormonal implants, and levonorgestrel implants. And I think Helen already mentioned about the high predominance of DMPA use in the areas of high HIV uh, prevalence, making it difficult to do observational studies with like, these other methods. Over the last couple of decades, the World Health Organization has repeatedly reviewed the evidence relating hormonal contraceptive use to HIV risk. And the last guidance that they provided in 2017 summarized that women at risk for HIV can use progestin only injectables, but they added advice that there were concerns about possible increased risk of HIV, that the causal relationship was uncertain, and then advised women on how to minimize their risk. So I think we're all in agreement about women's rights to know whether the contraceptive method they're using increases their risk of getting HIV. Women also need to make informed choices, not only about what method to use, but which HIV prevention method is most suited to them, with their method of use and their lifestyle. So a randomized trial, again, as Helen has alluded in, in her talk, provides the highest quality evidence to enable women to make fully informed choices, inform clear counseling messages for clinicians, and also offer guidance for policymakers and programs on how to provide the best services possible. So what, what is ECHO? ECHO was a multi-center, open-label, randomized clinical trial comparing HIV incidence and contraceptive benefits. In women living in areas of high HIV incidence and using one of the three highly effective licensed contraceptive methods. The three of these was intramuscularly delivered DMPA, 
a copper IUD, and the levonorgestrel implant. The primary objective was to compare HIV incidence amongst women randomized to these three methods, the DMP, copper IUD, and LNG implant. We also had secondary objectives. This included comparing the randomized method to rates of pregnancy, to, to contraceptive method continuation, serious adverse events, and the adverse events that led to method discontinuation. The ECHO trial began in December 2015, and participant follow-up was concluded last year, October 2018. So what was the rationale behind selection of methods? We know that there are very many other methods beyond the three. DNPA intramuscular was included because it's a contraceptive that observational data suggested could increase HIV susceptibility, and it's commonly used in many African settings, again, as we saw on the map, that have high HIV prevalence. We also included the copper IUD to have a highly effective non-hormonal comparator. The levonorgestrel implant was included to <coughs> represent another progestin-based contraceptive. Currently, the use of long-acting reversible methods like implants is rapidly increasing in the African continent. Levonorgestrel is also part of many oral contraceptive pills, and it's also currently um, part of the multi-purpose prevention technologies that are in current development. We had 12 trial sites in four countries, Eswatini, Kenya, South Africa, and Zambia. So what, what was the selection criteria for women who participated in the ECHO trial? They were required to present themselves as desiring effective contraception, not pregnant, being HIV zero negative, age between 16 to 35 years, agreeable to using the assigned method for the 18 months of follow-up, and not having used the injectable intrauterine or implantable contraception for six months prior to enrollment to the trial, and able to provide written and informed consent. A point to note is that women were recruited for this trial based on residing in geographies that had high risk of HIV, but not on the individual characteristics of HIV risk that we traditionally know, such as transactional sex, history of STIs, or self-reported high risk behavior. Study follow-up occurred one month after enrollment to address contraceptive side effects, then quarterly for the total duration of 18 months of follow-up. Um, included in these visits was HIV testing, contraceptive counseling, and safety monitoring. In addition, women were counseled that they could at any time choose to discontinue their randomized method. They could choose another trial method, or they could use a totally different method or opt out of any contraceptive use. Women who discontinued their randomized method or change method were retained in the trial. In 2017, when we had the most updated WHO guidance, all women who were enrolled were provided updated inform information based on that WHO guidance, which I spoke to earlier. Women in this trial were provided a package of HIV prevention uh, services. This included HIV risk reduction counseling, partner and participant HIV and STA testing and management that provided access to condoms. And as soon as it became part of national standard of prevention, they were also provided pre-exposure prophylaxis. So it gives me pleasure to hand over to Tina. Great. Well, Nelly, thank you very much. This is Tim Mastro with FHI 360. It's a privilege for me to be part of the, the ECHO team. And uh, while the ECHO team is very pleased to be here in Durban presenting the ECHO trial and results, um, one special member of the ECHO team is not with us today, and we've dedicated the ECHO trial to the memory of Dr. Ward Cates, our dear friend and colleague, who for most of his 22 years at FHI 360 was the president of research. And Ward played a, a, a really pivotal, inst pivotal instrumental role in, in getting uh, ECHO conceptualized, implemented, and going. 
Uh, unfortunately, we lost Ward uh, just three years ago to following a courageous battle against cancer. Uh, he was alive for the beginning of enrollment in the study, and I'm sure he'd be pleased to see what's happened afterwards. Ward is really a remarkable person, and everybody that knows him, I know, will put him in a very special category as somebody who's truly extraordinary. I first met Ward 30 years ago when I joined uh, CDC as an EIS officer, and Ward was then one of the pillars of science at the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, Ward has always been a champion for the integration of women's reproductive health and HIV, one of the world's leading champions of family planning and HIV integration. He started his work at CDC as head of the, uh, the abortion surveillance branch, did important work to describe um, the epidemiology of abortion outcomes, and his work led to safer procedures and, and saved many women's lives. He then went on to be the head of the sexually transmitted infection division at CDC and was the head of that division when um, AIDS uh, started in the United States. And he quickly grasped the importance of a sexually transmitted viral infection uh, that would go on to be known as AIDS. He was able to weave his uh, background in, in reproductive health, especially for women, with his passion for HIV prevention, and that led to a strong basis of family planning uh, HIV integration. He was always troubled by the lack of high quality data on the potential association between hormonal contraception and HIV. As a rigorous scientist, Ward always encouraged us to follow the data. And for Ward, that meant we need high quality data on this, on this uh, unresolved question. So Ward, along with Helen and others, made the case for the need for high quality evidence, a randomized, a randomized clinical trial to provide these data to inform women of the world and policymakers on what the reality was about a potential interaction between contraception and HIV risk. Ward was also instrumental in mobilizing resources uh, to raise uh, from donors the $50 million required to do the ECHO study, and I'd be, I know he'd be pleased to know how far we've come through today. Ward always looked for win-win outcomes in any dilemma, and we hope that the ECHO study is a win-win for the women of the world and everyone else. Over his nearly 50-year career, Ward was an inspirational mentor. He, he mentored nearly three generations of public health scientists, physicians, practitioners, including myself and many people on the ECHO team, and many of you potentially on the, on the phone. So anyway, I'm sure Ward would have been delighted to be here today Echo is an important part of Ward's legacy. We know he would very much like to see the data that you're just about to hear from my colleague, Jared Bate. Jared? Thank you and hello everyone. Uh, this is Jared Bate from the University of Washington. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on, the, uh, on this webinar with you, all of you today and to be able to present the ECHO results. I'm presenting them on behalf, obviously, of a tremendously large and dedicated team. So just a quick reminder, um, ECHO, was the, ECHO was a randomized clinical trial. The trial was designed with 80% power to detect a 50% increase in the hazard of HIV for each of the three contraceptive methods compared to each of the others. So when we talk, when you hear the results today, you will hear them um, in three pairs, DMPIM versus copper IUD, DMPIM versus the LNG implant, and copper IUD versus the LNG implant. A 50% increase in HIV risk was chosen based on formative work with stakeholders to determine a meaningful difference that would inform policy change. 7,829 women were enrolled in ECHO. Again, they were between ages of 16 and 35. They desired contraception, and they were willing and with informed consent um, uh, able to be randomized. In an equal fashion, about 2006, 2000, in an equal fashion, they were randomized as follows. 2,609 women to DMPAIM, 2,607 to the copper IUD, and 2,613 to the LNG implant. The average age was 23 years, and 63% were less than 25 years of age. Most, just over 80%, were not married, and, and most, similarly, had been previously pregnant at least once. Half did not use a condom with their last sex act, but only 7% reported more than one partner in the prior three months. STIs were common. 18% had chlamydia infection, 5% gonorrhea, and 30% had herpes simplex virus type 2. 
A Samples were tested from a randomly selected subset of women um, from the time of their enrollment visit. And these blood samples were, blood samples were tested for MPA, medoxyprogesterone acetate. 13% of women had levels suggesting potential use in the prior six months, so a minority. <laughs> Follow-up in terms of retention as well as method continuation were both extraordinarily high. 99% of women completed at least one post-randomization HIV test, and retention was 93.6% through to the final study visit. 99 plus percent of women accepted their randomized method at enrollment, and participants used their assigned method for 92% of the time that they were in the study. And that was 93.1% for women assigned to DMPAIM, 89% for women assigned the copper IUD, and 93.7% for women assigned to the LNG implant. So now for the results. In total, 397 of the 7,829 women enrolled in the study acquired HIV during follow-up. This translates into an overall rate of HIV infections of 3.81% per year. Here are how those results um, uh, split out across the three different randomized groups. And I draw your attention first to the table at the top. Of the 397 infections, 143 occurred among women assigned DMPAIM at a rate of 4.19% per year. 138 infections occurred among women assigned the copper IUD at a rate of 3.94% per year. And 116 infections occurred among women assigned the LNG implant at a rate of 3.31% per year. The cumulative probability of acquiring HIV is illustrated in the graphic uh, on the bottom. Look at the larger graphic first, all the way to the left. That is, the, that is a, the cumulative chances uh, that a woman acquired HIV. And then the inset graphic is that same picture, but just magnified so that the maximum probability is 10% rather than 100%. As you can see in this graphic, um, blue is DMPIM, green is LNG implant, and red is copper IUD. These are quite tight with each other, sometimes crossing as well during follow -up. So let's compare these HIV incidences. This is exactly the same table that was present on the prior slide. When DMPIM was compared to the copper IUD, the hazard ratio was 1.04, with a 96% confidence interval of 0.82 to 1.33, and a p-value of 0.72. For DMPIM versus the LNG implant, the hazard ratio was 1.23, with a 96% confidence interval of 0.195 to 1.59, with a p-value of 0 0.097. And for the copper IUD versus the LNG implant, the hazard ratio was 1.18, with a 96% confidence interval of 0 0.91 to 1.53, with a p-value of 0 0.19. Additionally, a number of secondary of subgroup analyses were done, uh, including among women who were younger than age 25, as well as among women who had, who had or did not have herpes simplex virus type 2 infection, as well as analyses that removed follow-up time after women discontinued their randomized method. Although method continuation was, was quite high in the study, among, in the time periods when women did not use their method, a sensitivity analysis was done as well. All of those subgroup and sensitivity analyses had results consistent with these primary intention to treat analyses. Pregnancy rates were low in all three groups. Importantly, most pregnancies occurred among women who had previously discontinued their randomized method. 71% of pregnancies occurred after women had discontinued the method that they had been assigned at enrollment. The comparison intention to treat is in the top table. The bottom table, a continuous use analysis, 
uh, censored follow-up time when women were, not, were no longer using the method they had been initially assigned. All methods had high contraceptive effectiveness. Although notably, the two hormonal methods has, had slightly lower pregnancy rates than the IUD. Serious adverse events were rare across all groups, illustrated here in the top row. Adverse events that resulted in method discontinuation were also relatively uncommon, overall 7% of women. However, the adverse events that resulted in method discontinuation were more common among women randomized to the copper IUD or the LNG implant, approximately 8% of women, compared to those assigned to DMPIM, approximately 4%. So in summary, this multi-country randomized trial measured HIV incidence among African women assigned to one of three highly effective contraceptive methods, acceptance of randomized method, contraceptive continuation, and retention were very high across all methods, demonstrating that the trial, which, was, which, was, which had been predicted to be quite challenging to do and was quite challenging to do, was done well. All three methods were effective at preventing pregnancy, and all were well tolerated. HIV incidence, which had been anticipated to be about 3.5% per year and was measured to be just slightly higher than that of 3.8% per year, was high for all three groups. When comparing the HIV risk across groups, we look at what we designed the trial to do. We designed the trial to detect a 50% increase in HIV incidence for each of the contraceptive methods compared to each of the others. None of the comparisons showed a 50% increase in HIV incidence. Under the design of the study, an observed approximately 30% increase in HIV incidence would have been found to be statistically significant and hazard ratio is less than approximately 1.17 or 17% increase, would have excluded a 50% increase in risk from the confidence interval. DMPIM compared to the copper IUD showed very comparable HIV risk. Again, as re-illustrated here, this was shown earlier. For DMPIM compar compared to the LNG implant as well as the copper IUD compared to the LNG implant, the point estimates were between 1.17 and 1.30. The confidence intervals included both no difference and a 50% increase. For logistical and financial feasibility, we chose to include three highly effective contraceptive methods available in the African region, including one non-hormonal method and two different progestin-only methods. Our results cannot necessarily be generalized in full to other contraceptive methods not included in the study, such as those mentioned here, as well as others. Very importantly, we enrolled women who desired effective contraception. There was no placebo group or no, no, or no contraceptive group with no contraception in this trial. For us, the salient question was weighing the relative risks and benefits of different methods. And that would be the salient question for women seeking contraception as well. And thus, a question of no method, we felt, was not, was not the relevant question here, but, rel but instead weighing the relative risks and benefits of three different methods. In spite of individualized HIV prevention package provided to all participants throughout follow-up, and countrywide HIV treatment and prevention programs, HIV incidence was still alarmingly high in this population throughout the course of the trial. And STI prevalence at baseline was also very high. Our results emphasize the need for more aggressive HIV and STI prevention and management efforts for African women, including PrEP and HIV prevention integrated with contraceptive services. As mentioned, we did provide an, an individualized HIV prevention package. PrEP was part of that package, although PrEP became standard of care quite late into the study and only overlapped about 2% of participant follow-up. So we emphasize there is need for, in programmatic settings as well as research settings, more aggressive HIV and STI prevention and management. In conclusion, many women in Africa are at high risk for HIV infection and for morbidity and mortality from unintended pregnancy. This well-executed randomized trial did not find a substantial difference in HIV risk among the methods evaluated, and all the methods were safe and highly effective. 
Our results underscore the importance of continued access to these three contraceptive methods, as well as increased and expanded access to contraceptive choices, complemented and integrated with high quality HIV and STI prevention services. It was mentioned earlier that, that 7,829 women gave of their time, their volunteerism, and their dedication to participate in the study. We thank them for their motivation and for doing so. We are incredibly grateful. Similarly to the, to their, to the communities that supported this work and supported the women in their participation in the trial, we can only be thankful. We thank the members of the, the Trials Data and Safety Monitoring Board, the Global Community Advisory Board, as well as community advisory boards at each site, and overseeing ethical review committees for their expertise and their guidance. ECHO, was funded, ECHO and its consortium were funded by a consortium of, of funders as well. And we thank them for, for their confidence to invest in this globally important study. And the funders are illustrated here. Further information about ECHO can be found on the ECHO Consortium website, here listed at the top. And as mentioned earlier, published this, af published this afternoon, South Africa time, um, online uh, on, the in the, on the Lancet, is the, the manuscript as well as related commentary. Thank you. I'm going to pass off now to um, James Carey from the WHO. So thank you very much, uh, Jared. Uh, for us in WHO, we really welcome the results of the ECHO trial. And we find that the results are reassuring at very many levels, uh, including the, the, that we did not find significant differences uh, in terms of HIV infection risk, but also the safety and effectiveness of the methods and the high rates of acceptability that was uh, observed. As we are planning for the WHO response uh, to this study, we are being guided by uh, two very important uh, considerations. One is the importance for us to ensure that women and girls have access to a choice of a wide range of safe, acceptable and effective methods. And the second one is the need for us to step up HIV prevention efforts particularly for young uh, women. And now going on to the specific of what WHO will do, and this is outlined in the slide uh, shown, uh, we have, uh, with publication of the manuscript, uh, embarked on a process of synthesizing uh, the evidence, uh, looking at uh, values and preferences, and also reviewing if there have been any additional uh, publications on this issue since the 2016 uh, review. And then uh, based on that uh, synthesized evidence, we will look at what does ECHO study add to that uh, evidence. We'll not only look at the ECHO study, but we'll look at the consolidated evidence. ECHO, however, adds the most robust uh, data we have to date on this issue because of the high level of execution and the fact that it was a well done uh, randomized uh, clinical trial. Uh, following this, we'll have a guideline development uh, process to review uh, the current uh, guidelines on contraception for women at high risk of HIV infection. In the last two weeks of uh, May, we advertised the members, proposed members of the guideline development uh, group, and uh, we have received uh, comments. Uh, on the bio sketches and conflicts of interest of the proposed members. And in the next few weeks, we'll be reviewing the membership so as to finalize and take into account uh, the input that we have received from various uh, people. The guideline development group meeting is planned for three days. It will happen on 29th uh, to 31st of July this, uh, uh, this year. And I apologize for the typo there. It's not 30th. It's supposed to be 29 to 31st of uh, July. And we anticipate that by the end of August, we'll have uh, revised uh, recommendations. Of course, uh, we know that it's up to the guideline development group to come up with the final uh, recommendations. 
And also, we, although we say that the results are reassuring in terms of their findings, the experts will look at the entirety of the evidence. In the meantime, we are continuing to technically support the member states uh, in the run-up to the release of the ECHO trial results. We did support uh, countries to prepare for these results. And we'll continue this process to support countries to communicate results and also that their immediate policy responses should be aligned with uh, guidance that is provided uh, by WHO. On, uh, we are also supporting the countries really to strengthen HIV, sexual reproductive health integration, which is one of the areas that the ECHO study findings uh, have highlighted. And in this regard, we are planning to have a meeting on the uh, 10th and 11th of July uh, in Lusaka of 14 of the high burden countries in Africa, where we will discuss how we can strengthen integration and also how we can expand the method options and choice in these uh, countries. <coughs> and finally, I would just like to highlight that uh, if you go to the WHO website, uh, you'll find several resources that uh, can support uh, during this period of responding to the ECHO trial results. Uh, you'll find the WHO statement in response to the study. You'll find responses to frequently asked questions regarding ECHO and the WHO plans. And you'll also find the current WHO recommendations. And you'll also find key, policy, key messages for policymakers, for providers, and for women, both in high and low uh, preference countries. So thank you very much. I hand over back to Helen. Thank you very much. I'm now going to invite Marga Casaro to say a very brief few words from her perspective of um, a site leader, a site PI in Lusaka. Margaret. Thank you, Helen. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, um, good evening. Um, as we started to share the results of, of ECHO, uh, I just want to comment on our experience and the reactions to the results. So speaking for myself and the women that we have spoken to, we have received these results with, um, I think I should use the word joy and uh, relief. And we have gone on to share those results on three levels. Uh, we have talked about the fact that uh, this study was done very well. And in discussing that, we have detailed to the women how we have been able to meet the matrices that were set for us in order to say that we are doing this study well. But that point is emphasized to the women that it is also their participation that has made us to get to this level and also acknowledging that they have contributed to such a great uh, moment in history in terms of contributing knowledge that will make us um, use uh, contraception with uh, more solid evidence than we have done in the last 30 years. Um, in discussing the primary outcome of ECHO, that is the HIV incidence, uh, the women are very happy to hear that um, none of the three methods that we uh, evaluated in ECHO increases the risk of acquiring HIV. And I'm glad to report that um, some of these, the discussion that has come out of that was led by the women. Uh, for example, one woman said, so it is not the contraception that puts me at risk of acquiring HIV. Rather, I should concentrate on making sure that I know my HIV status, that I use condoms, and that uh, I should use PrEP. Uh, so the question around PrEP and that they've asked coming out of that is, where can we get this? I know that you were providing it uh, during the study through another site, but is there a place we can continue to get this? So I think the discussion around that is that women are excited and they want to be able to utilize everything that is available in order to prevent HIV. And lastly, we have emphasized that um, uh, ECHO has shown us that these three methods are safe and they are effective um, uh, in terms of discussing what side effects we saw, uh, 
across the three um, methods and uh, the pregnancy rates. Um, so I think in summary, um, what we have seen is that these results have been well received uh, by both myself as an investigator and the women in Lusaka. Yes. Oh, just now, uh, the last person to comment uh, from the perspective of the community is a member of our, our global community advisory group, Jackie Wambi. Yes, hello everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to hear the voice of the community, the voice of the women, and um, <clears throat> we appreciate this space. So, just to reiterate uh, what uh, we have been saying as the Global Community Advisory Group, we welcome the results, of course, and um, of course, we see that it provides to continue our work to ensure that all women, especially young women, have more information, understanding, choices, options, and agency, of course, when it comes to achieving and enjoying their sexual and reproductive health and rights. Note the word enjoying. Uh, of course, we thank the team, partners, and donors for the investment in research to advance the health and well-being of women, especially young women, and we look to continue partnership at the intersection of family planning and HIV. Um, based on the results, which uh, we've all been waiting for, and it's like almost like uh, we're almost exhaling, but we realize that this is actually just the beginning, the beginning of our work. Their results are not good news. Women in this trial were recruited and enrolled because they wanted contraception and weren't sexually active. They did not have the risk factors we hear about in so many other trials. ECHO is a wake-up call to put HIV prevention on site at every family planning clinic, including PrEP and female condoms with peer support and trained providers. The quick question about DMP has been answered, but that does not mean that the method can continue to dominate women's contraceptive programs in East and Southern Africa. We don't believe that DMP should continue to be the only long-acting method available for too many black and brown women who want choices, dislike side effects, and deserve equity with high quality contraceptive programs in high income countries. ECHO showed, of course, that method mix is possible. Women use many things. Women like many things. Policymakers, funders, and service providers must work with women in the lead to make sure this happens everywhere. Women need strategies to prevent pregnancies and HIV infection at the same sites from the same providers in rights based women centered content. Throughout ECHO, the risk of a planned pregnancy and HIV were pitted against each other by scientists and normative agencies. Now is the time for integration, the story we've been singing for a very, very long time. And this has to include investigation, more research on how to deliver services that meet contraceptive needs well, and what is driving HIV risk to address it and more. So <clears throat> as a GCAG, of course, we have our asks. and we are demanding that every East and Southern African country must now make or implement with a full funding plan with milestones for expanding contraceptive method mix and uptake and integrating HIV prevention into contraceptive service points. Because we always hear the issue of, yes, it's possible, but there is no funding. There is a meeting that is going to be held by the WHO in, in Zambia, prompted by the ECHO results, and this should generate a declaration of commitment to this along with a commitment from funders to put money into this work and revisit the key milestones across the regions and in countries in at least a year's time. Uh, this review can be guided by um, other you know, um, uh, method mix and choice indicators that have been developed by uh, uh, organizations like FP2020. And of course, there's uh, also an integration index piloted by the group, group uh, for based in the United States it's known as CHANGE. And then, of course, this review must be validated by the ground forces, who are us, the women, who live and work and love in the places where these trials happen. There is nothing for us without us. Nothing can call itself a woman-centered approach with a straight face if it does not have women, especially young women, in the lead. We also talk about uh, accelerated action to invest. Again, um, we are going back to, to the issue of funding and expand available and accessible contraceptives and HIV prevention 
tools, including the pipeline for the future. One sad thing to note is that PrEP came in, came in a bit late in, in the trial. And again, it's, it's just speaking as, as a woman, it's, it's one thing to provide a product, but it's another very important thing to find out whether this woman would be able to take this product. What are the things around her that would be able to make her to adhere to these products that she has to use so that she can prevent uh, both pregnancy and HIV? So full information is key to equipping women to work with their health center, their healthcare provider, to make and be supported in a decision that works for them in their contact of life. Of course, gender equality, diversity, and human rights are fundamental. The, WHO, the WHO consolidated guideline on the section on reproductive health and rights of women living with HIV exists and is a key framework for how the results should be understood and how action should be catalyzed. The most affected women, especially young women in Africa, must be meaningful and central partners in the decision-making process and forward steps with WHO countries and donors. WHO should include women who have been working on this issue in the guidelines review group. We've been speaking about this group for some time. The experience and expertise on the topic is key in informing the guidelines process. WHO must be proactive, transparent, and in partnership with women. WHO has a leading, leading role to play in this results interpretation, dissemination, and rapid responses. That's all for me for now. Thank you very much. Uh, Mitchell, over to you. Great. Uh, Jackie, um, a perfect exclamation point on everything that the ECHO team presented. I want to thank you all so very much. I also want to thank um, the many hundreds of people who are on the line. I realize we um, have a lot of ground to cover and amazing questions have come and I'm delighted that um, so many hundreds of people um, are on the line and we are going to keep going and please stay with us. Um, a lot of questions have come in. I'm going to do my best to bundle them in the interest of time, I'm sure we won't get to absolutely everything, but we are keeping very clear note on FP2020 and AVAC um, are committed to working with all the partners to get information out. So don't worry if we don't get to everything. Um, let me start. There are several questions about some of the terms, um, the design, and the statistics. So let me try to throw out to the trial team a couple of them, and maybe you can condense them. Some are really straightforward. Some may take a, a minute to, to explain. Um, but there were questions about the duration of the trial and the time uh, of participation in the study. So uh, that, that's one aspect of it. Um, someone asked, was the study, uh, did it stop early? Was this as planned? Or um, did you need to extend it? So if you can talk about the original sample and recruitment strategy. Um, and and uh, a third piece, um, a number of people, questions and both comments about how the incidence rates of infections might have compared to general populations or to non-contraceptive users. And I think helpful if you all could give a quick description of the decision um, and rationale for not having a non-contraceptive arm in the study. And then let me throw one more out before I turn it back to you all. Um, and it relates to the analysis of the study and um, a, a number of, of, of really uh, great comments and questions about some of the terminology about the significance, a term of um, statistics, the p-values and the hazard ratios, and um, a question specifically perhaps to you, Jared. Um, to help all, all, all of us on the call as reproductive health advocates, um, how we might in lay language describe um, these um, these results um, and um, because there do, do seem to be differences in um, some of the comparisons of methods but um, the issue of, of just explaining what is the hazard ratio and what is significance within those p-values. So I realize that's a lot to throw at you um, uh, but maybe we'll pause there and see how you all can can address those. So, um, well, Jared will take some of those questions, and I'll ask Nelly to comment on the incidence, uh, how this compares to the general population. So, Jared, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mitchell. Thank you, everyone, for great questions. So, uh, the, the trial started in December of 2015 and ended in October of 2018. In but, of course, on the day that the trial started, only one of the 7,829 women was participating in the study. Each woman who participated in the study participated for up to 18 months. And those, all of those who enrolled first 
had 18 months in the study. Those who enrolled, the very last women enrolled in the study uh, could, contributed about 12 months of follow-up. The trial went to its natural end. It did not stop early. The design of the trial was to go until about 10,000 person years of follow-up and 10,409 person years of follow-up were done. So it was a natural, uh, natural ending of the study last year. Um, and then the uh, and then the question there is a question of diff of some statistical terms. Um, a hazard ratio is um, uh, is is the <laughs> is 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 a measure is a is the measure of increased risk. So a two point zero hazard ratio is a doubling. A 1.5 is a 50% increase. We aimed the study to be, to be able to, with good statistical confidence, to be able to see 1.50 if that were truth. None of the comparisons showed that. I think we would summarize it as none of the, none of the contraceptive methods in this study showed a substantial increase in HIV risk compared to any of the others. And that's reinforced with the, the hazard ratios, which are the measure of that, and the, the p-values as well are the measure of statistical significance, so uh, uh, another statistical method. I think the summary that I take away is none of them showed a substantial increase in HIV risk. And then we'll ask Nelly just to comment on the question about incidence rates um, and uh, the, 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 the population from which we drew this and how would, what, how this compared to a non to non users yeah i think this is a really natural question when you see the high rates of incidence um, and as you had in the study design we didn't select women who didn't use a method and it's we don't have data it's difficult to have population level data what we have is data from other hiv prevention trials in the placebo arms and incidence rates amongst young women in those trials continues to be high. And that's a comment. And I think we just need to build up on this issue of what we can do to safeguard women from HIV incidence. I think the other thing we noted was a concern that we were giving an, an optimized package of HIV prevention in the study. And even with that, we saw these high levels. So if this had not been there, you could speculate on whether in fact the incidence in the general population might even be higher. Yeah, I wonder if I could just comment further on a little, you know, I think it's, it's we've, we've often said that HIV risk is beyond the individual, that it's beyond the clinic. So we can do a lot of things from a health point of view, which we should and must do, including offering PrEP. But I think it's not enough to take an individual girl, 18, 19, 20, 25, tell her what to do, send her to the community to ask her to get her partner tested, tell her to use her prep well, to use male condoms well, and anticipate that she can stand strong and uphold the use of those services. I think we need to do more to get the community to own HIV prevention and work with our young women in safeguarding them from HIV. Thanks, Mitchell. Do you have other questions? Great. I, I do. And actually, Nelly, um, where you ended a couple of, uh, one specific question about um, uh, behaviors in the trial and then a, a general question about the results. So um, first, someone mentioned, and I think rightly saw in a close reader of the actual publication that's now online, that in, um, in the DMPA IM arm, there was reported um, I think higher condom use and fewer multiple partners, as I recall, than the other two arms. And wonder um, if you all can both uh, explain that and what that impact may or may not have been, and perhaps also take the opportunity to update us on what other um, social behavioral analyses might be forthcoming. And the second is a more general, which I think is such an important question for, for all of the people on the call, as we all think about how these results get disseminated and, um, and, and thinking ahead to how as a community we, we, we talk about this. And someone's raising that given the high incidence across all three arms, what's to stop a, a lay person uh, who may not work in our field day to day from just assuming contraceptive use is the, is the reason for that 
high rate of HIV and, and uh, across all three methods and something I know you all have thought about as you communicate these results and, and um, would love to have you to maybe talk about both of those things. Yeah, so yeah, this is Jared Baton again. Um, so to speak to the first question. Uh, so as as noted, so what we what we emphasized today in the presentation were the primary results and the pr pr principal objectives of ECHO. As um, there are a number of additional things that are in the paper that's coming out in the, that came out in the Lancet today, and then there will be many many more analyses into the future from such a robust uh, study like this. Um, we did measure se self-reported sexual behavior um, in the trial and over time, and there were differences between women on different methods on the different methods that may be quite uh, to our assessment potentially just part and parcel of using those methods themselves the magnitude of those differences was was small in addition we did sensitivity analyses that accounted for diff for differences in sexual behavior and those sensitivity analyses do not change the results or its interpretation there will be many more analyses into the future from ECHO, including social behavior analyses from some of the other data that we have, and, and also side effect analysis. I'm going to ask Tim to comment on, what, what, from a layperson's perspective, could there be a misunderstanding when you see these high HIV rates across the three methods? And how would one avoid that and explain it? Yeah. Well, well thanks, Helen. And Mitchell, thanks for queuing that up. We, we've uh, spent quite a bit of time thinking about this. There's really no basis for for that interpretation of the findings that, um, you know, in, in epidemiology we talk about the counterfactual, which is really what would have happened if you didn't do what you did, and that becomes something very difficult to know. That if you had a comparable group of women, similar age, similar settings, that were not on contraception, what would the incidence be in that group? And so it's a very hard thing to know. But what we say is that we didn't find a difference in the, the HIV acquisition across the three methods. We, of course, used one non-hormonal method, and we compared two hormonal methods to that. But we also should remember when ECHO was designed, we chose communities and sites where, based on history, we thought there might be an HIV incidence of about 3.5% per year. And indeed, we found overall 3.8%. So the incidence rates that we found, while we're deeply concerned about them, they're high rates, unfortunately, the reality in, in Southern Africa is those are not rare phenomena of having those kind of incidence rates in young women. And we see them in other HIV prevention studies where HIV negative people are enrolled and then followed. So I think all of us, as we're communicating the results, um, should describe that we didn't find differences between the methods, and there's really no basis to presume that uh, without the methods of contraception, somehow HIV incidence would have been lower in these women or a comparable group of women. Thanks. Mitchell, are there other Great. questions? Great. Thank you. Um, there are, and it's actually, we, we, I, we have a bunch about the future, but let me start with the more immediate future for the ECHO team. Um, and a question both about um, the women who did become infected on in the trial, um, what provision um, was made and is made for them in an ongoing way for treatment? And also, um, women were randomized to these three methods, as you all described. Um, what are the future options for the women in the trial? The trials ended. How how does that continue with the methods that they may choose? And 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 just wondering if you all could help describe the relationship to to rolling into future programs for both treatment and prevention uh, and contraception. So, so in, in terms of the, the women who are infected, um, in all the sites, women were referred uh, for uh, the, the local standard of care for treatment, but all of the sites had um, research referral centers which were offering antiretrovirals and um, ongoing management. In terms of uh, the women at the end of the study, one of the things that was done around the sites was to look at what, what, what was available in terms of ongoing family planning contraceptive service support and where required extra training was offered into those sites so that the women would be able to, to have the management of their method. I'm going to ask Margaret to also comment specifically 
from her experience in Lusaka? Um, so at the beginning of the trial, we had plans in, in place in how we're going to manage uh, participants who might see or complete uh, and be HIV positive. So the SOPs took uh, care of how we manage them in uh, making sure that they have access to government provided HIV management uh, services. And these were either the ones that were linked to uh, the study by way that we are sitting in the same environment or whichever clinic that the participant chooses to uh, attend. We made sure that they access this by uh, providing as much counseling as possible as they required, not to just they themselves. And if they required uh, further support with family, we provided that also. We also provided services of actual escorting participants to the clinic so that they may be able to access. For those that refused to access these services, we continued to provide support right to the end of the study and uh, continue even to this day to support them uh, on their choices. So basically, I think I'm in agreement with what Helen has just described, but uh, just discussing it in relevance to what happened in Lusaka. Mitchell, over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, that is incredibly helpful. Um, we had a question that um, I, I, and I know we, we still have others, and I am conscious, though, as I watch um, some people dropping off given the time. Um, a, a really important question came up about um, thinking about the future as well, and it's one um, uh, particularly for um, for uh, Beth, uh, my, 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 my partner here in, in our conversations, and it relates to um, considerations for indicators on strengthening integration between sexual reproductive health and HIV, um, something I know we, we've talked a lot about, but how you all at FP2020 um, are thinking about it as really such a, a, a critical data um, monitor, uh, if, if that's something um, for consideration as uh, FP2020 looks to the future and even to the SDGs as, as the questioner had. Thank you, Mitchell. It's a great question. And the timing for us couldn't be better because we're in the process now of undergoing a global consultation that'll be running throughout this year of what the community wants from family planning going to 2030. And for FP, that to guide FB 2020 as we then make adjustments to what our partnership looks like uh, going forward. So you have our commitment that we will be doing so in partnership with the HIV community so that um, we are aligned um, to use all of these resources um, as, as um, fruitfully as possible. But measurement is certainly a part of that. And we do have a measurement group at FP 2020 that is going to be looking at our current measurement agenda and making recommendations for how it can measure whatever this pivot is for us in terms of our overall structure and process season. And we will certainly be looking at um, integration as well. And we look to your partnership, Mitchell, um, in how to effectively measure that as well. I'm going to ask Great. James to comment from a WHO perspective very briefly. James? Great. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think also from uh, WHO, these discussions on integration, I think, have been going on for quite some time. And uh, really, ECHO and other studies should really be a wake-up call for us to really act. Uh, previously, WHO has developed uh, quite a number of uh, indicators and an index for integrating SRH and uh, HIV uh, services. Uh, these are available on the WHO uh, website. I think as uh, was the call from uh, Jackie Wambo is that we probably need to prioritize some of these indicators and really get uh, us as uh, implementing agencies, as governments, as global bodies to commit to achieving some of these uh, indicators for integration and to really also put uh, resources behind uh, these uh, processes. Thanks, and, and I think it would be excellent if FP2020 are also thinking about this to try and streamline uh, global indicators between yeah. the organizations. I think that would be excellent. Mitchell, over to you. Great, no, thank you. And, and actually, um, it's a perfect uh, addition. There were a number of questions about the future, and I think that um, uh, the, the monitoring and, and indicators are critical. Um, 
a couple of questions that um, maybe for, for all of you in Durban as well as for Beth, um, are there specific, as you all reflect, some of you have been pondering these results for some weeks, some of you getting it fresh on the call, are there specific um, social behavioral and perhaps other epidemiologic questions that you think um, need to be prioritized um, going forward, um, coming out of the ECHO study, and then a related thinking into the future, um, given um, the, the high uptake and retention uh, in the trial and, and, and certainly clear uh, acceptability of the three methods, um, what the implication, but, but clearly the high incidence of HIV at the same time, implications and opportunities for advancing an agenda that many of us are, are think about, and that's multi-purpose products, and, and wonder um, if any of the panel want to respond to um, what practically should come next, both, as they say, social behavioral science uh, um, on the one hand and product development for next generation multi-purpose products on the other. So I, I'm sure many of us would, would come in. I'll just say a couple of things and then hand over. Um, I, I think that uh, one of the things that we have to understand better are what are the drivers to both use contraception but also use HIV prevention technologies, including PrEP. So, so in, t in terms of that, understanding how we can access um, the, the, the women younger and older who are not currently accessing services look at what the barriers are to that and, and really try and address it. Because I think one of the, the concerns that we all share on this call is that incredibly high unmet need in the, in particularly in the African region. So, so I think that understanding barriers and, and really trying to reach out to the women we're not reaching is very important. I would also say one thing you didn't mention is uh, I, I think that we need better implementation science. We need to know how we should be implementing what we already know should work and do it better and be smarter. I think that the, the very heavy focus that we have still on clinics with long queues, et cetera, really needs to be thought about again. And if there are ways that we can actually think smarter, better, and, and think about women's lives and how accessing contraception and HIV prevention technology, how we can fit into those, those lives. And, and finally, I think uh, just talking to, to certainly young women, in, I, I work in the center of Johannesburg, which is a very tough downtown area. If you say to those young women, what do you want? They'll say to you, and obviously this is in a context where injectables are very common, they'll say, we'd love something like an injection that does both things, contraception and HIV. Uh, we, we might in the future have a ring as an option. And we, we need to look at whether the, uh, what the uptake, if we do get a ring that's finally approved of the licensure for HIV prevention, is it possible to get something that then uh, is going to be a multi-purpose prevention technology in the form of a ring, which might well suit a different type of woman at a different point in her life to say a, a combined acceptable. I'll stop there, but others might want to come in. Jim? Yeah, no, I think uh, I agree with all the issues that Helen has highlighted. I would like just to add one thing that I think ECHO has highlighted is really the very high burden of uh, treatable and curable STIs among the women uh, participants in this uh, study. I think this is something that uh, going forward, we really need to pay attention to and uh, probably uh, really understand how we can better intervene to address this uh, STI body. Uh, Tim? Yeah, thank, thanks, John. This is Tim Masher with FHI 360. Um, so in terms of socio-behavioral research, certainly there's a great deal of information in the ECHO study that we'll, we'll continue to analyze and look at. We've got a number of analyses and things coming forward. But I, I've been struck through the whole process. I think we need to look at the socio-behavior of us as practitioners and scientists in the community. We too often wear a hat that says FP or HIV on it, and people often look at this dilemma from their perspective. And we're here at an AIDS conference in, uh, in Durban, South Africa, and uh, we, you know, and part of the purpose of this webinar is to make sure that the family planning people are able to listen to these, uh, these data, the results, and discuss them a bit. But I would encourage all of us to um, not have a dichotomized view of the world of FP and HIV, and it really needs to be as I think Nellie um, uh, put very ar articulately, you know, what, what does a woman's perspective mean and how does a woman actually 
um, take the guidance and advice she's given and how does that really being implemented in the field. And so um, think, thinking about that rather than a disease specific and seeing more of the, um, uh, the women's perspective, I think is an important socio-behavioral issue for all of us. Nelly? Well, I, th I think uh, our colleagues have really spoken well to what else needs to be done to understand better. But I truly believe we need to understand communities better. Um, I think we've heard a lot about long queues, quality of service. You know, how are we going to actually break that down when a woman goes for family planning service, when a provider has a queue of 40, uh, we can all sit in boardrooms and talk, but until we intervene at that point, that integration is going to be difficult. So the yeah. issue of putting in resources is key. So how we get our governments to invest more in health and health for women and translate it to a bigger benefit. I've had people in Treasury in my country say, you need to talk to me in economic terms. I just don't want to hear the whole year sad story. So I think we need to find the right conversation to communicate broadly at all levels of stakeholders and, incl and include the people who make decisions and who distribute resources in country and on a global level so that a woman's life is more valuable and gets invested into. And then I'll just maybe without repeating myself too much is, is go back to the model of epidemic control. When we have cholera outbreaks, we don't sit in hospitals dishing out antibiotics and diagnosis. We go right into the community and talk about how you wash your hands, how you drink clean water, and we involve members of the community in owning the problem and intervening. So I think this discourse of HIV also has to go back to the community owning the problem and, and being part of that solution in protecting women and themselves. Jackie's nodding. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie is covered. <laughs> Over to you, Mitchell. Well, I, I was just going to ask you, Jackie, but I have to say, Nelly, I'm not sure if you heard it, because um, Zoom is funny, but there's like standing ovations for some of what you said coming in the chat feature. Um, so I, I hope that you can hear the applause um, for what you just said. And, and um, I was going to ask Jackie if you had any last thoughts about, um, you know, you're in Durban today, but back in, 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 in Nairobi, back in community, is there a message that you will not only take forward, but want all of us to be reminded of, um, uh, to amplify? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Just, just going forward, and, and of course now speaking to the women that Nelly is speaking about, um, just to emphasize that we have to make this service delivery comfortable for this woman. Make it look or make it work in a way that when a woman gets to the clinic, she's able to access all these services. And I mentioned also that we may have all these services in two years when we get the funding, but what happens to this woman when she goes back to the community? Is she able to use these male condoms that you give her a whole box for the 40 days? Will she be able to negotiate the condom use? These are the kind of things that we have to think about. Um, is it possible for somebody to prevent themselves from HIV by Maybe, you know, like taking a pill every day, for example, is it, it practical? These are the kind of things that we have to think about and talk about so that when the woman is trying to access these services, she will not find these barriers. And especially speaking about the young, the young women who are so diverse and they want to fit into society just like anyone else and may not have the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the environment where they're able to take these uh, preventive methods. Let's just put um, all those things um, uh, into consideration when we're going forward. Thanks much. Great, Jackie. Thank you so very much. Um, and thank you all in Durban. I know it's been an incredibly long and, and um, exciting and challenging day. And, and on that note, I want to turn to you, Beth. Um, you know, there's both um, reasons to be both excited and interested and relieved on some of the results and, a, and, and, and many other reactions of, of alarm, frustration, and concern. And I wonder, um, as really a pioneer and leader in, in FP 2020 and, the, and, and, and that community and movement, um, what's the take home for you for FP 2020 and, and where should we all be going next? 
Thank you, Mitchell. Um, this has been really incredibly helpful and inspiring. Thank you so much to the ECHO team in Durban for, um, for coming onto this webinar and sharing with the broader community. I wanted to, to end with three things. One is that we know we learned in, in these settings in the four countries and they were, they were stable settings with regard to healthcare. But when we were talking about the need for dual and triple protection and Helen, I think that what you said is exactly right. There has to be more investment in these methods. And I know Pop Council and others are working on them, but we haven't, because of the settings that we looked at, and that's important, we haven't talked at all about women who are displaced, who we know um, in humanitarian settings or when they're forced out of their homes are subject to increased risk of sexual violence, and also then unintended pregnancies, STIs, and HIV. So the imperative to really develop these methods so women who are unprotected have some form of protection that's in their hands is absolutely critical. And so we not only need to talk to each other, but we also have to be working smartly with the humanitarian community so that we're, you know, we're working toward the same objectives and, and trying to solve things for women who are in a lot of different settings who need us to, to work on this. I also wanted to read something quickly that was written um, and published today, a commentary by Yvette Raphael, who's an advocate for um, HIV prevention and is a member of the CCAG, because I think she put it beautifully. Yvette wrote, um, but what study results can do, and this I've learned from my work as an advocate and activist, is to spur action in powerful ways. The ECHO results should be used to mobilize action that directly, systematically, and generously addresses the issues that women face every day. Programs that don't offer choice, but instead reinforce shame. Shelves that are empty when they should be stocked with options, with some of the stockouts tied back to corruption and mismanagement of funds at the highest levels. Clinics that treat one part of a woman, but not her whole self, so that contraception is offered, but not HIV prevention or treatment or vice versa. So Yvette, we hear this, and you have our commitment from FP 2020 that we will be working with HIV partners so that the next iteration of Family Planning 2020 to 2030 can answer some of the questions that you put forward in that challenge that you so beautifully articulated to all of us. So thank you, Mitchell. I do see a lot of hope in all of this. We know now, we clearly see um, where much more work needs to be done and that integration is one of the fail points that we all have to focus back toward. I think Jared said earlier, this is a clarion call for that, and we absolutely agree. So thank you for your partnership together. I know we'll, we'll accomplish more than we ever could in our, in our silos from before. Thank you. Great, thank you, Beth. Um, and thank you, everyone involved. And thank you for almost 500 people who stuck it out for an hour and a half um, for such an important conversation that doesn't end. Um, in fact, today is, is really a beginning. I do wanna also just acknowledge the ECHO team who, um, have shown an amazing amount of transparency and openness and community engagement throughout the design and implementation of the trial. <clears throat> and I'm reminded actually both of Ward, but also of uh, another researcher who after a trial several years ago that many of the researchers of this team were involved in, said in, in a concluding slide, choose to work with people that you trust, respect, and enjoy. And that is the partnership that I think we all <clears throat> will uh, take forward today. So. Um, with that, a very long day for everybody, particularly those of you in Durban. With great thanks, many more questions to come, and, um, and much more collaboration to follow. So thank you all, and have great nights, afternoons, and uh, on the west coast of the U.S. still uh, uh, enjoy your morning. Um, thanks again, and um, please do follow FP2020, AVAC, and the ECHO websites. These things will be posted, many more articles to come many more commentaries, and most of all, hopefully a lot of action. So thank you all, and um, have a great day. Thank you, Mitchell.